Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today, 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 1. In our last lecture, we covered uh, chapter 10, and chapter 10 covers the ruin of Saul. And that kind of serves as a fitting introduction to the ascension to the throne of David. And from chapter 11 through chapter 29, the last chapter of First Chronicles, we're going to be covering the history of King David. Uh, was King David a good king? Well, all future kings of Judah would be compared to how they walked with the Lord uh, with how David walked with the Lord. Was David perfect? No, he, he had faults like all the rest of us. None of us are perfect. But one thing David never did was fall away into idolatry as many of, the, uh, of his descendants would. Um, in chapter 11, we want to make a couple uh, mental notes about it. Uh, chapter 11, we pick up with the history of David and Israel at Hebron. Now, that was before or after, I should say, chapter 12. When we get to chapter 12, we back up in time to when David and his men are at Ziklag, in which case Saul is still alive at that point in time. Saul is dead at Hebron when David and Israel were at Hebron. So let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua Jesus' precious name, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we pick it up our study today, 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 1, and it reads, Then all Israel gathered themselves to David unto Hebron, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Therein lies the key of David, knowing the bone and flesh uh, from, from father to son, father to son, umbilical cord to umbilical cord, from David to Messiah. That's the key of David. Now, Hebron, a little history on it. Uh, it's an ancient Canaanite city. Uh, as far as age, it rivals Damascus, uh, known of and recorded in history centuries and centuries and centuries ago. Uh, Hebron would lie approximately 20 miles south of Jerusalem, and it's written in chapter 3, verse 4 of First Chronicles that David was at Hebron for uh, seven years and six months, uh, and then he was at Jerusalem for 33 years. David reigned a total of approximately 40 years. Hebron, again, lying about 20 miles south. Now, at this same time, we notice in this verse that all Israel gathered themselves to David. And we have a little bit of a situation going on with the ten tribes to the north during this period of time. Abner, the lead general of, of Saul, set up Ishbosheth, the remaining son of Saul who was still alive, as king over the ten northern tribes for about two years. Uh, he was more or less set up as a puppet king because it was Abner who was running the show. And verse 2, And moreover, in time past, even when Saul was king, thou wast he that lettest out and brought us in Israel. These are the people of Israel speaking to David. And the Lord thy God said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be ruler over my people Israel. Laying out and bringing in is a term, a Hebraism, a figure of speech that means in day-to-day -day activities. Uh, the people knew David and, and knew him well. And you remember, he, he was but a youth when he uh, killed the, the uh, champion of Gath, the giant, 
uh, named Goliath. And so he, he had a reputation from an early age on. And you remember when Saul was having success against the Philistines, when the armies would return, the young ladies would sing, Saul has killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands. So uh, it wasn't that the people didn't know David and that the people didn't like David. I like this, that, that, that God said unto thee, thou shalt feed my people Israel. Well, what does a shepherd do? A shepherd makes sure that the sheep have plenty of pasture. In a spiritual sense, that means that they have the word of God. And God took uh, David, a shepherd of sheep, and turned him into a shepherd of men. David, of course, being a type for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, the greatest shepherd of all time. Verse 3, Therefore came all the elders of Israel to the king to Hebron, to David. And David made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord, as Lord as their witness, in other words. And they anointed David king over Israel, according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. And Samuel was a little bit reluctant uh, to anoint David, as it's written in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, uh, that, that God spoke to Samuel and said, Samuel, how long are you going to mourn the fact that I have rejected Saul as king of Israel? And I want you to go, and this was in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 17, uh, get over it. I'm not going to change my mind. Now you go, Samuel, go and anoint David the king of Israel. So this is actually the second time that David was anointed the king of Israel. David would be approximately 37 years old at this point in his life. Verse 4, And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were the inhabitants of the land. Now, this is classic Hebrew writing. A, a, what, what happened is stated, and then we're going to have an explanation of how that came to pass following the fact of what happened. Jebus, uh, most of you know, was a Canaanite city. The Jebusites are one of the seven Canaanitish tribes and they were the ones that built Jebus, which would later be changed the name from, by David to Jerusalem. This is the city that God spread his skirt over and took to wife. He, he married Jerusalem. That's what God meant when he said you had in Ezekiel chapter 16, where it states that he spread his, his skirt over uh, Jerusalem. It states that you had, God said to her, you had an unclean birth. And that's what he meant when he said that was that the heathen Canaanites, the Jebusites, were the one who uh, birthed, if you will, or formed or brought the city into existence. <clears throat> now, some of the uh, Jebusites, as in all the Canaanitish tribes, had mixed in with the Nephilim, the fallen angels. So you had Geber uh, giants that were uh, among the Canaanites. You remember the the thirteen, the spies, the twelve spies in in Numbers chapter thirteen that went into the Promised Land to check it out. They saw these giants and they came back and they put fear in the hearts of the people and said, "Well, there were giants over there. There's no way that we can defeat them." We were like grasshoppers in their sight. Verse 5, And the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, Thou shalt not come hither. Nevertheless, David took the castle of Zion, which is the city of David. The, the Jebusites told David in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 6, that the city, the, the citadel, I should say. Now understand, Israel had already destroyed the city of Jebus, burned it basically to the ground. What we're talking about here is the castle, the, the fortress, if you will, uh, that it was very walled, very defensible. 
And the fact is the Jebusites told David in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 6, that we could, all the fighting men could leave the citadel and just simply leave the blind and, and the lame here and they would be able to protect and keep Israel from taking it. Obviously, they underestimated uh, the, the abilities of David and his men. Verse 6, And David said, Whosoever smiteth the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain, um, the commander-in-chief, in other words, of the armies. So Joab, the son of Zariah, went first up and was chief. Now, Zariah, the sister of David, had three sons. Uh, the eldest was Abishai, uh, Joab was the, the next in, in line, and then there was a younger brother named Azahel. All three of them uh, served David and served him well. Joab would be the one, though, that he became jealous of Abner. In fact, as well, not, not, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a minute. But let's go to verse 7. And David dwelt in the castle, therefore they called it the city of David. That was common at this point in time. The, the commander or the king of the defeating or the, the, the winning, the victorious armies, they would name the city, the capital, after him. That's why Jerusalem or Jebus became known as the city of David. Uh, one time, at one point in history, in later years, Joab was fighting against uh, the capital of the Ammonites, Reba, and, and the siege had been going on for some time, and he realized that the Ammonites were about to fall, and he summons David to come quickly, lest they name the city uh, the city of Joab. He didn't want to take that honor. I meant to say, too, in a moment ago, Zariah, uh, you know, oftentimes it seems to me that women are not mentioned by name in, in the Bible. Zariah, I can think of no other woman that is mentioned by name more times than David's sister, uh, Zariah. Verse 8, And he built the city round about, even from Milo round about, and Joab repaired the rest of the city. Milo means the filling up. And it's quite a bit of controversy among scholars as far as what was Milo. I think that what uh, David did was he built up the wall uh, from the valley north of Jebus uh, down to the south of Moriah. Verse 9, So David waxed, or became, greater and greater, and the Lord of hosts was with him. Don't overlook that verse. Why? did David become greater and greater? Because the Lord was with him. And I mentioned in our last lecture, what I hope you get out of Chronicles is that when you do things God's way and you receive his blessings, you're going to be successful. You're going to become greater and greater. Don't do things God's way. Look, look what happened to Saul. He was rejected of the Lord and he died. Under David and Solomon, uh, Israel would become the greatest nation uh, in the, on earth at the, that point in time. Uh, the, the area that they controlled grew, the geographical area grew, uh, the area that they had economic influence over grew even more than that. They had economic influence all the way to the north, to the river Euphrates, uh, under Solomon, they uh, had uh, access to the Gulf of Aqaba in the south, from which uh, Solomon launched the ships of Tarshish, which would go to Ophir and bring back uh, untold values of gold, uh, the finest gold that was known in the world from Ophir. Uh, under Solomon, it's written that in Jerusalem, silver was like rocks for its abundance. So. Uh, under David and Solomon, the nation of Israel was quite successful until Solomon uh, started uh, worshiping the gods of his foreign wives. Uh, that brought about the split of the nation. Verse 10, 
These also are the chief of the mighty men whom David had, who strengthened themselves, I think better translated, they held strongly with him, with him in his kingdom and with all Israel to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. And the Lord said that he was to be the king in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 12. Now, in the next several verses, uh, well, the rest of this chapter, we're going to be talking about uh, people who were tremendously brave and courageous, uh, who were ferocious warriors. And if it's your first time through this chapter, you're probably going to get a little confused, but I'll do my best to, to help you stay straight. Uh, it might help to preface it by saying we're going to be talking about, first of all, we're going to be talking about three men who were of the highest class of David's heroes, the highest rank, maybe a better word, of David's heroes. Then we're going to be talking about three others who were also great heroes, but they weren't as great as the first three. And then finally, we're going to be talking about David's 30 uh, heroes in the final chapters of this verse. I'll try and help you keep it straight as we go through. Verse 11, And this is the number of the mighty men whom David had, Joshobim and Hatmonite, the chief of the captains. He lifted up his spear against 300 slain by him at one time. Now, at times, David had a ragtag army at first of all. He had a ragtag army of 200. And you might wonder, well, how could 200 go up against the thousands of the armies of Saul in Israel? Well, it's because David had men like Joshobim who could go up against 300. And if you think 300 is a large number, well, make a note of 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. For there, it states he could go up against 800 and defeat them, slay them at one time. Verse 12, the second of the three greatest. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo. Dodo is from the same prime in the Hebrew language as David. It means loving and Ahohite, who was one of the three mighties. Okay, well now we've discovered that we have three mighties. Well, where is the third? Who, who is the third, we might ask? Well, we've got Joshobim, for sure. We've got Eleazar. In verse 13, the he starts off, is referring to Shema. Well, how do I know the third one was named Shema? Because I've read 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 11. And Shema is the one that did what is stated in verse 13. Uh, the way it's written, the way the chronicler wrote it, it appears that the he is referring to Eleazar of the previous verse. It's not. It's referring to Shema, who was the third of the three mightiest. He, referring to Shema, was with David at Pasdamim, and there the Philistines were gathered together to battle, where was a parcel of ground full of barley. And the people fled, the armies of Israel fled, and running for their lives in fear from before the Philistines. And they, this referring to David, uh, Joshobim, Eleazar, and Shema set themselves in the midst of that parcel and delivered it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. With God on your side, you always have the victory. David was not one to run from his enemies, and he had three servants that would set themselves, make a stand against the enemy, and when the rest of the armies of Israel were running in fear, David, Joshobim, Eleazar, and Shema uh, made a stand. Now we come to the second set of three mighty men of David. <clears throat> now verse 15. Now three of the thirty captains went down to the rock to David, 
into the cave of Adullam, the host of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Raphium. Raphium uh, means Rapha was one of the great of the uh, descendants of the Nephilim giants. He was a great as Anak was. And David was then in the hold. He was safe, in other words, in the cave. And the Philistines' garrison was then at Bethlehem. Now, David, that's his birthplace. And the enemy, the Philistines, has control of the town, which you know rubbed David the wrong way. And David longed, or he wished for, and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem that is at the gate. Be careful what you wish for and made known out loud when you have people under you that are as loyal as David's servants were. Bethlehem, not only the birthplace of David, but the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Uh, when I think of water in Bethlehem, I think of the living water that came into being as a result of that water that if a man drink of it, he would never thirst again. And the three break through the host of the Philistines into Jerusalem and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem, the water that David expressed that he would like to be able to drink. That was by the gate and took it and brought it to David, but David would not drink of it, but poured it out to the Lord. Now this is a little difficult to understand if you don't understand that the thinking in ancient times was that a man's soul was in his blood. And because these three risked their lives, their souls, uh, to obtain this water, David is saying it would be like drinking their blood and he would not do it. When I think of blood and Bethlehem, I think of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross that made salvation a possible ability for the whole world. Verse 19, and David said, My God forbid it me that I should do this thing. Shall I drink the blood of these men that have put their lives in jeopardy? They risked their necks. Uh, it was kind of a dangerous thing that they did going behind enemy lines. They, they jeopardized their lives to obtain this water. For with the jeopardy of their lives they brought it. Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mightiest. Now this is what causes so much confusion to people when they study this chapter. They think that this is still talking about the initial, the highest class of mighty men. Uh, Moffat translates, did these three mightiest, did this trio of knights, K-N-I-G-H-T-S. So uh, their work, and some scholars think that it is still talking about the first class of the three mightiest but I don't think so. I think that there we had a, a complete second group of people from uh, uh, Joshua Beam, Eleazar, and Shema. Verse 20, And Abishai, the brother of Joab, this being the eldest son of uh, Zariah, the sister to David, he was chief of the three. And for lifting up his spear against 300, he slew them, and had a name among the three. I think this is Abishai was one of the second class of three, but he had a name among the three, this meaning that Joshobim, uh, Eleazar, and Shema knew who Abishai was and respected him, but he did not obtain attain to the highest rank uh, that the first three attained. Verses 20 through 25, we have the second class of heroes. Again, not equal to the, the preceding three, but they were still uh, ferocious warriors. Of the three, referring to the second level of three uh, mighty men, he was more honorable than the two. I think this should have been translated, 
he was honored before the three as two. In other words, he was doubly honored for he became their leader. For he was their captain, he was their leader. Howbeit he attained not to the first three. He didn't make it quite to the same level as Joshua Beam, uh, Eleazar, and Shema. Uh, I wanted to mention too, don't confuse Eleazar here with Eleazar, uh, the son of Aaron. Uh, that, that doesn't fly. This is Eleazar, the son of Dodo, as we covered in verse 12. Verse 22, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, Kabzeel, a city in Judah, who had done many acts, great deeds. He slew two lion-like men of Moab. Also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. And this uh, Jehoiada, Benaiah, excuse me, would remain uh, faithful to Solomon uh, when one of David's other sons, Adoniah, led an insurrection trying to take the throne uh, from Solomon. Make a note, too, of chapter 27, verse 5. We learn there that Jehoiada, the father of Benaiah, was the chief priest uh, at this time. Verse 23, and he slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits in height. Now, depending on whose cubit you went by at this particular time, that would be between eight and nine feet tall. And in the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam. A weaver's beam can be 26 feet long. And he went down to him with the staff went down to him with a shepherd's hook, uh, basically a stick, and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. Now that's a ferocious warrior. Uh, a normal sized man goes down with basically a stick and takes the spear away from a man that's eight to nine feet tall away from him and kills him with his own spear. Uh, these, these were ferocious warriors. These were the men that, that David depended on to uh, make his ascension to the throne possible. Verse 24, these things did Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and had the name among the three mighties. Again, the three mightiest, uh, Joshua, Beam, Eleazar, and Shema, knew who they were, uh, but they did not attain to the first class. Behold, he was honorable among the thirty, but attained not to the first three. And David set him over his guard. The guard is an audience. Uh, in other words, when the audience would be the location where the king, in this case David, would have his throne. And people would come there for judgment, uh, he might also give audience to foreign ambassadors, visitors from other countries at that location. Uh, in other words, uh, Benaiah was the head of David's bodyguards, a very trusted, uh, very honored position. <clears throat> now in verses 26 through 47, we come to a list of David's 30 heroes, as they're often referred to in other places uh, in Samuel and the Kings. Now, I'm not going to bore you with reading the names of all of these 30, but I do want to point out a couple that are important, in, in my opinion. Uh, Azahel, we find there in verse 26, uh, he was the youngest son of Zariah, the sister of David. And what happened to Azahel when he was still fairly young? Uh, jo uh, Abner uh, met up with Joab and the other men of Judah, and there were men of Israel there under Abner, and they made sport. They, they were practicing war. And what happened was, and you need to know, Azahel was very fast afoot. In one place he said he could run like a roe, a deer. He could run like the wind, he was fast. But 
Uh, at one point, he took off and he was chasing after Abner, and he intended to kill Abner. And Abner was a seasoned uh, veteran warrior. And Abner, out of respect to him, Abner tried to get him to turn away. He twice said, Azahel, turn to the left or to the right. Don't make me kill you. Well, Azahel wouldn't stop. And Abner had to kill Azahel in self-defense. Joab would never forgive Abner for killing his younger brother, Azahel. In fact, is uh, under the cloak of friendship, uh, even so much as with a kiss, uh, Joab uh, came up to Abner and ran him through the eighth rib and killed him uh, for killing his brother. The other uh, party that you're probably familiar with, uh, in verse 41, we have Uriah the Hittite. Now, Uriah the Hittite was one of the 30 heroes of David. And while Uriah the Hittite was off to war, um, David saw Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, taking a bath in an open courtyard. And he liked what he saw, and even though she was a married woman, uh, he summoned her and he had a, uh, a relationship with her, an adulterous relationship. Let's call it what it is. It was adultery. And there was a child that resulted of that. In an effort to cover up the uh, adultery and the, the child coming forth, uh, David sent for Uriah the Hittite uh, and under the cloak of pretending he was inquiring how the war was going and then he was hoping Uriah would go down to his house, sleep with his wife, and that would cover the fact that she was with child. Uh, one thing David wasn't planning on though, Uriah was very loyal to his men and he said, I won't go down to my house and sleep in the comfort of my bed while my men are out there in the field sleeping in tents and in war. Well, David com committed murder. Let's just call it what it is. He sent Uriah the Hittite back with a note to Joab for Joab to send Uriah to the hottest front where he was killed in battle, uh, purposely on, on David's uh, design. But, you know, I think it's very uh, humble of David to have chronicled these men in chapter uh, 11, that, that we see that they supported him, but he supported them as well for, for him to sit down with paper and pencil and write out their names and what uh, courageous men they were. Uh, it's notable. And I think David loved his men. I think his men loved him. And uh, we'll come back in chapter 12. We're gonna back up in time a little bit to when David was at Ziklag for a period of one year and four months in our next lecture. Saul is still alive at that point in time, remember. We got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good from the United States and our good friends to the north in Canada. If you're listening somewhere else around the world by internet or whatever other means that you have to watch the program and you're not able to use that 800 number, 
feel free to write in with prayer requests and questions. If you do have a biblical question, and please keep your questions of a biblical nature. Uh, if they're not of a biblical nature, they're probably not going to get answered on the air. But please uh, call that number and leave your question. Who knows, it might end up on the program. I know if the Holy Spirit wants it to, it certainly will. Got a prayer request? Well, you we can do away with that number. You don't need a telephone. Talk to your Heavenly Father. You know, all too many people, I don't think you have a lot of competition these days. Everyone's so busy uh, running here, running there, never enough time to, to do this, never enough time to do that, never enough time to talk to God. Uh, things start going bad when you ignore your Heavenly Father. Uh, talk to Him daily. Do, do it and, and thank Him for the many blessings that He bestows upon you. And if you don't think that he's bestowing blessings on you, you might do a little self-analysis, you know. Am I doing anything to deserve his blessings? So, and you're probably taking some of his blessings for granted. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father. We ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, Father. Sickness in families, we need your touch of healing, Father. Uh, weakness, Father, against the enemy. We, we know that you have the ability to give us a strengthening if we ask for it, Father. We ask this on behalf of these, if it is your will, in Jesus' precious name, amen. And thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions, see what's on the mind of folks. First up today, we have Mary in Indiana, and your teachings are a blessing and I'm so grateful to and for you and your staff. Thank you. Well, you're sure welcome. It's a, it's a labor of love. My question is regarding to where it is found in the Bible that life begins at conception. In biblical days, didn't a person's age start at conception? Well, uh, Luke chapter 1, uh, verses 41 and 42 uh, Mary, uh, just having been touched by the Holy Spirit and just having conceived our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, went into the presence of her cousin Elizabeth, who was six months with John the Baptist in her womb. And when Mary came into the room, John the Baptist, in his mother's womb, leapt at the presence of the Holy Spirit. So. Tell me, was the Spirit there at conception? Yes, it certainly was. Uh, Jeremiah uh, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, Jeremiah was kind of saying, Lord, you know, don't send me. I'm young. They're not going to listen to me. And the Lord said, Jeremiah, I knew you before I placed you in your mother's womb and ordained you to be a prophet. So, yes, the, the soul is in the embryo. No question about it. Renee in Minnesota, are you teaching there is such a thing as reincarnation? I will never believe that you stated something such as could you have been evil or bad in the first earth age? You answered yes. What? Question mark. What's the first earth age? Question mark. Is that what you refer to as reincarnation? Uh, you are scaring me. Please answer my question. Well, we do not teach reincarnation. Uh, it's written in the New Testament by Paul that it is given to man but once to die. You, Renee, obviously don't understand the three world ages. You see, God created all souls in the first earth age. Uh, Satan led a rebellion, and one-third of God's children followed Satan. So God had a choice. He could destroy a third of his children, or he could have this, the second earth and heaven age, which is the age that man would be born in the flesh. Most men, some refused to be born in the flesh. They're called the Nephilim, the fallen angels. But no, we do not teach reincarnation. Uh, a couple of lessons if you want to continue studying with the chapel that might help you out. Uh, CD 30533 entitled Incarnate, Reincarnate, 
And then also you need to study uh, 30506, the three world ages. If you don't understand the three world ages, you're never going to understand the mysteries as they are stated in the New Testament. Uh, they're mysteries to some people because they don't know about it. <clears throat> God's elect know what the three world ages are and uh, understand his overall plan. You see, there is a third earth and heaven age coming. Uh, it's when uh, Jesus Christ returns as King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, there's going to be a great period of teaching during the millennium, and then we go into the eternity. Some of us go into the eternity. Some uh, go into the lake of fire, never to be thought of again. Satan is one of them. Massimino in Nevada, question raised, because Adam and Eve were created by God instead of being born from a woman, would this mean they were created like the angels? Or do I have it wrong? You have it wrong. Uh, they weren't created as the angels were in the first earth age. What's the difference? Well, God uh, knelt down and scooped up some of the dust, some of the clay, and he formed Adam and Eve of the dust. Angels were not formed of the dust. So that's the answer to your question. Curtis in North Carolina, what does it mean to pick up the cross and follow him? Uh, well, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, uh, also in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, if anyone chooses to follow Jesus, uh, they should deny their fleshly desires and pick up the cross and follow him. You know, he was willing to die for you on the cross. Or the question is, are you willing to die for him? And that's what that means by pick up your, cro his, your cross and follow him. Sue in Kentucky, are we in the millennial days? When is the millennium? No, we're not in the millennial days. Uh, the millennium is the Lord's day. Um, that occurs when Jesus returns at the second advent. Well, how can you say the millennium is a thousand years, you might ask. Well, how do you say that's the Lord's day? Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8, one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. <clears throat> Rachel in California, how old are we in spiritual bodies in heaven? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, but I want you to first of all realize that age in spiritual bodies is really irrelevant. Uh, in a spiritual body, time becomes less significant. I can't biblically document it, but I believe everyone will be approximately the age that Jesus was when he was crucified, which would be 30 to 32, 33 years old. Melissa from Missouri, my brother is married to a man. I choose not to associate with him and knowing their relationship, it sickens me. I'm sorry for feeling this way, what do I do? Well, number one, you shouldn't be sorry for feeling that way. Your heavenly Father, <clears throat> excuse me, feels the same way that you do about such relationships. They are an abomination to him is what the, the Word of God says in the book of Leviticus. Well, you don't understand, Pastor Murray, that's Old Testament. Uh, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, the New Testament came in, and God is okay with homosexuality now. No, he's not. It's even in the New Testament, it's an abomination to your heavenly Father. And those who say that it's all right now are turning things upside down. They say what is right is wrong, and what is wrong is right. It doesn't change it in God's eyes, but uh, they um, obviously they're misleading a lot of people thinking that, oh, it's okay now with God for, home, for men to marry men and women to marry women. It's not okay. It's an abomination. Sue in Indiana, I have learned so much from watching Shepherd's Chapel. 
Wish I had found you long time ago. I have a question. How will we know when we are in the one world order? Will it happen quickly? Thank you so much, Sue in Indiana. Well, we see the beginnings of the one world order even today. Uh, you have uh, the EU, a uh, group of 28 nations that have a common currency. I guess that's about to become 27 uh, nations that have a common currency due to uh, Brexit. Uh, you have the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. All of these things that tie international to monies are the beginnings of the one world order. And you said, will it happen fast? Well, it's, it's not happening fast, it, but you see the beginnings of it. So uh, everything is going to happen on God's time frame, though. So uh, you can read about the one world uh, system, the beast, in, in Revelation chapter 13, where you have two beasts mentioned. The first is the one world political beast. The second is the Antichrist. Kenny in Kansas. Good morning, Pastor Murray. I wanted to thank you for your clear and simple way of conveying our Lord's letter to us. Uh, it's rare and priceless. Well, thank you for that comment, Kenny. My question today is, though I'm patient in waiting for an answer from God, how at the age of 43 do I find my gift for success from God? How can I serve him best and still provide a good income for my family? Well, Christians provide an income for their families. You take care of your family first, but you can do that and also serve the Lord. Now, what your calling is, Kenny, I, I can't tell you. Uh, what you need to do is pray to your Heavenly Father. Ask him to reveal what it is that he wants you to do. Uh, throw out a fleece, uh, as uh, Gideon did. Uh, he'll, he'll answer. We'll have it in prayer with you. Mike in Texas. Um, dear Pastor Murray and family, all members of the body, uh, my writing concerns study over the electronic airwaves and such. Many of us are isolated in our beliefs because of caution in fellowship. You claim we are in church uh, by just studying with you through the television. Is not the church the many-membered body and needs uh, one and the other? Yes, members of the body uh, depend on other members of the body. Uh, I think that is the reason, uh, what you're talking about is one of the reasons that Passover is such a special time for Shepherd's Chapel. Uh, we have uh, it's anywhere between 2,500 and 3,500 people that show up for Passover annually. And it's such a wonderful time because I think a lot of people feel the way you do, isolated. And it's so refreshing to be around that many people who do we all agree on everything? Of course not, but we are like thinking and have the truth. You might consider uh, also uh, Mike requesting a bumper sticker. Um, we have people that send in letters at least every week. We get a letter from someone that said, I ordered a bumper sticker from Shepherd's Chapel. I was in the parking lot uh, of the local grocery store and somebody started honking their horn and we talked and formed a Wednesday night Bible study, so uh, might consider that. Might consider coming to Passover if you haven't done that. Laureen from Alabama, I listen to you six days a week and read my Bible along with you. The problem I have is I can't remember what I hear or what I read. I pray about it all the time. My question is, will God forgive me for not remembering His word like I want to. I also enjoy your weekly, uh, monthly newsletters and re that I receive every month. Okay, well, you know, we are a many-membered body and uh, different members of the body have different functions. Uh, uh, if everybody was the mouth of the body, we wouldn't be able to walk. 
we wouldn't be able if the, if everybody uh, had hand was the hands of that we wouldn't be able to walk but we could work um, but my point is that every one one of us has different gifts and abilities and if you're not called to be a preacher or a teacher it's not necessary that you have uh, an excellent memory of God's Word. Uh, God gives different gifts to different members of the body, but to whom He gives much, He also expects much. Laverne, Laura, I guess it is, from Oregon. My name is Laura. I'm from Oregon. I've been watching and studying with Shepherd's Chapel for almost 10 years now. I would like to thank you and your staff for bringing me closer to God through your daily Bible study and prayer. Well, we're glad that you're studying with us and thanks for remembering our staff. I have a question. I have always been confused about the Trinity, the God, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all being one. Can you explain to me how all three are separate yet one? My mind always wants to separate them as individuals. Perhaps uh, it would help for you to think uh, that we're talking about one entity with three different offices. And uh, you might order, uh, Pastor Arnold Murray did a, week, a work called Nature of God El Shaddai. And that's CD 30574. It covers the Shepherd's Chapel uh, position on Trinity. And that brought to mind, we had some critics uh, at one point who were saying that Shepherd's Chapel didn't teach the Trinity, that nothing could be farther from the truth. We, we, we hardly do a lesson without speaking of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jack from Ohio. There is something not to forget to tell everyone that do willfully sin. That would be Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. If there is no sacrifice after we sin, and you say if you do sin, it's a great thing to repent unto God so that he may forgive you. I don't understand, please explain. Well, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 is speaking of the unforgivable sin. The unforgivable sin is for one of God's elect to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, which means to for, for reject the Holy Spirit speaking through one of us when we're delivered up before the Antichrist. Um, that's what the difference is. Any sin that you've committed up to this point, you can repent and be forgiven. If you're one of God's elect and only one of God's elect could commit blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, uh, to do that is unforgivable. There is no repentance for that sin. It's very, very serious. Chester in Minnesota, is there scripture about homosexuality, homosexuality in the Bible? Boy, there sure is. Old Testament, Leviticus 18, 22. Leviticus 20, verse 13. For a man to lie with a man is an abomination to our Heavenly Father. Well, you don't understand, Pastor Murray. That's Old Testament. Uh, things have changed with Christ being crucified on the cross. No, they haven't. Romans, New Testament, Romans 1, verses 24 through 27, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, all uh, prohibit uh, man lying with man or woman lying with woman. It is an abomination to your heavenly Father. Am I teaching hate? Absolutely not. What I am teaching is God's Word. What you do with God's Word is entirely up to you. Uh, my job is teaching God's Word, and I won't uh, change anything that my Heavenly Father has said. The day I have to start changing what my Heavenly Father said will be the day that I stop teaching. Linda in California, inside the garden were their vegetarians. Well, I mean, may, maybe so, maybe not, but. 
uh, we're told in, in Leviticus chapter 11 what meats are clean for us to eat and what meats are unclean for us to eat. That's Leviticus chapter 11. You can eat clean animals, unclean animals, or you're not supposed to eat. They'll make you sick. Kevin in Virginia, my question is that I have heard you say once you die, you're with the Father. But what about the scriptures, Acts 2, verses 29 through 34, and John 3, verse 13? Well, it states in verse 34 of Acts chapter 2 that David is not ascended into heaven. What it's talking about there is his flesh body didn't ascend into heaven as Jesus Christ did because he was transfigured. The point David's flesh saw corruption, uh, Jesus' flesh did not uh, see corruption because he was transfigured. Uh, John 3.13, all souls that have ascended to heaven also descended from heaven. Uh, what that's saying is God created all souls and he places those souls in the embryo at conception. And what it's saying there is you can't ascend to heaven unless you descend first. The fallen angels refused uh, to be born of woman. Uh, they did not descend. They descended from heaven, but it wasn't their soul. It was them, and they came to earth and went into the daughters of, of Aaron, and the giants were the result. I'm out of time. I want you all to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you make time every day to sit down with your Bible and the letter that God wrote to you. And you know what? It makes his day when he looks down and he sees you trying to learn of him what's pleasing to him. When you're pleasing to him, you can expect and claim his blessings. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we've helped you. Please help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, you stay in his word every day. Every day in his word is a good day because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.